Ulysses 15, B. The Second of Seven Parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. 15, B. George Fottrell, Clerk of the Crown and Peace, resonantly. Order in court. The accused will now make a bogus statement. Bloom, pleading not guilty and holding a full-blown water-lily, begins a long, unintelligible speech. They would hear what counsel had to say in his stirring address to the grand jury. He was down and out, but, though branded as a black sheep, if he might say so, he meant to reform, to retrieve the memory of the past in a purely sisterly way, and return to nature as a purely domestic animal. A seven-months child... He had been carefully brought up and nurtured by an aged bedridden parent. There might have been lapses of an erring father, but he wanted to turn over a new leaf, and now, when at long last in sight of the whipping post, to lead a homely life in the evening of his days, permeated by the affectionate surroundings of the heaving bosom of the family. An acclimatized Britisher, he had seen that summer eve from the footplate of an engine cab of the Loop Line Railway Company, while the rain refrained from falling, glimpses, as it were, through the windows of loveful households in Dublin City and urban district of scenes, truly rural, of happiness, of the better land, with Drockwell's wallpaper at one and ninepence a dozen, innocent British-born bairns lisping prayers to the sacred infant, youthful scholars grappling with their pensums or model young ladies playing on the pianoforte, or anon all with fervour reciting the family rosary round the crackling yule log, while in the boreens and green lanes the colleens with their swains strolled what times the strains of the organ-toned melodeon. Britannia metal-bound with four acting stops and twelvefold bellows a sacrifice, greatest bargain ever. Renewed laughter, he mumbles incoherently. Reporters complain that they cannot hear. Longhand and shorthand, without looking up from their notebooks, loosen his boots. Professor McHugh, from the press table, coughs and calls, Cough it up, man! Get it out in bits! The cross-examination proceeds, re Bloom and the bucket. A large bucket. Bloom himself. Bowel trouble. In Beaver Street. Gripe, yes, quite bad. A plasterer's bucket, by walking stiff-legged, suffered untold misery, deadly agony. About noon, love or burgundy, yes, some spinach. Crucial moment, he did not look in the bucket. Nobody, rather a mess, not completely. A titbit's back number, uproar and cat calls. Bloom in a torn frock coat stained with whitewash, dinged silk hat sideways on his head. A strip of sticking plaster across his nose talks inaudibly. J. J. O'Malley, in barrister's grey wig and stuff gown, speaking with a voice of pained protest. This is no place for indecent levity at the expense of an erring mortal disguised in liquor. We are not in a beer garden, nor at an Oxford rag, nor is this a travesty of justice. My client is an infant, a poor foreign immigrant who started scratch as a stowaway, and is now trying to turn an honest penny. The trumped-up misdemeanor was due to a momentary aberration of heredity, brought on by hallucination, such familiarities as the alleged guilty occurrence being quite permitted in my client's native place, the land of the pharaoh, prima facie. I put it to you, that there was no attempt at carnally knowing. Intimacy did not occur, and the offence complained of by Driscoll, that her virtue was solicited, was not repeated. I would deal in especial with atavism. There have been cases of shipwreck and somnambulism in my client's family. If the accused could speak, he could a tale unfold, one of the strangest that have ever been narrated between the covers of a book— he himself, my lord, is a physical wreck from cobbler's weak chest. His submission is that he is of Mongolian extraction and irresponsible for his actions. Not all there, in fact. Bloom 
barefoot, pigeon-breasted, in lasser's vest and trousers, apologetic toes turned in, opens his tiny mole's eyes and looks about him dazedly, passing a slow hand across his forehead. Then he hitches his belt sailor fashion and with a shrug of oriental obeisance salutes the crowd, pointing one thumb heavenward. Him makey really moochy fine night. He begins to lilt simply. Lily poo little child, blingy pig foot every night, pay to shilly. He is howled down, J. J. O'Malley, hotly to the populace. This is a lone hand fight. By Hades, I will not have any client of mine gagged and badgered in this fashion by a pack of curs and laughing hyenas. The Mosaic Code has superseded the law of the jungle. I say it, and I say it emphatically, without wishing for one moment to defeat the ends of justice. Accused was not accessory before the act, and prosecutrix has not been tampered with. The young person was treated by defendant as if she were his very own daughter. Bloom takes J. J. O'Malley's hand and raises it to his lips. I shall call rebutting evidence to prove up to the hilt that the hidden hand is again at its own game. When in doubt, persecute Bloom. My client, an innately bashful man, would be last man in the world to do anything ungentlemanly which injured modesty could object to or cast a stone at a girl who took the wrong turning when some dastard responsible for her condition had worked his own sweet will on her he wants to go straight i regard him as the whitest man i know he is down on his luck at present owing to the mortgaging of his extensive property in the agandath and the tame in faraway asia minor slides of which will now be shown to bloom i suggest that you will do the handsome thing bloom a penny in the pound the image of the lake of canareth with blurred cattle cropping in silver haze is projected on the wall moses duglaise ferret-eyed albino in blue dungarees stands up in the gallery holding in each hand an orange citron and a pork kidney Luggaz Horsley Bleibtraustrasse, Berlin, W. 13. J. J. O'Malley steps on to a low plinth and holds the lapel of his coat with solemnity. His face lengthens, grows pale and bearded with sunken eyes, the blotches of phthisis and hectic cheekbones of John F. Taylor. He applies his handkerchief to his mouth and scrutinizes the galloping tide of rose-pink blood. J. J. O'Malley, almost voiceless. Excuse me, I am suffering from a severe chill. I have recently come from a sick bed. A few well-chosen words. He assumes the avine head, foxy moustache, and proboscidal eloquence of Seymour Bush. When the angel's book comes to be opened, if aught that the pensive bosom is inaugurated and soul transfigured and of soul transfiguring deserves to live, I say, accord the prisoner at the bar the sacred benefit of the doubt. A paper with something written on it is handed into court. Bloom, in court dress. Can give best references. Messrs. Callan Coleman. Mr. Wisdom Healy, J.P., my old chief Joe Cuff, Mr. V. B. Dillon, ex-Lord Mayor of Dublin, I have moved in the charmed circle of the highest Queens of Dublin society. Carelessly. I was just chatting this afternoon at the Viceregal Lodge to my old pals, Sir Robert and Lady Ball, Astronomer Royal at the Levee. Sir Bob, I said. Mrs. Yelverton Berry in low corsaged opal ball dress with elbow length ivory gloves wearing a sable trimmed brick quilted dolman a comb of brilliance and panache of osprey in her hair arrest him constable he wrote me an anonymous letter in pretense backhand when my husband was in the north riding of tipperary in the munster circuit signed james lovebirch he said that he had seen from the gods my peerless globes as i sat in the box of the theatre real at a command performance of la quigale 
I deeply inflamed him, he said. He made improper overtures to me to misconduct myself at half-past four p.m. on the following Thursday, Dunsink time. He offered to send me through the post a work of fiction by Monsieur Paul de Coq, entitled The Girl with the Three Pairs of Stays. Mrs. Bellingham, in cap and seal coney mantle, wrapped up to the nose, steps out of her brougham and scans through tortoise-shell quizzing glasses, which she takes from inside her huge opossum muff. Also to me, yes, I believe it is the same objectionable person, because he closed by a carriage door outside Sir Thorny Stoker's one sleety day through the cold snap of February ninety-three when even the grid of the waste-pipe and the ball-stop of my bath-cistern were frozen subsequently he enclosed a bloom of edelweiss culled on the heights as he said in my honour i had it examined by a botanical expert and elicited the information that it was a blossom of the home-grown potato-plant purloined from a forcing case of the model farm mrs yelverton berry shame on him a crowd of sluts and ragamuffins surges forward the sluts and ragamuffins screaming stop thief hurrah there blue beard three cheers for ikey mo second watch produces handcuffs here are the darbies mrs bellingham he addressed me in several handwritings with fulsome compliments as a venus in furs and alleged profound pity for my frost-bound coachman palmer while in the same breath he expressed himself as envious of his ear-flaps and fleecy sheepskins and of his fortunate proximity to my person when standing behind my chair wearing my livery with the armorial bearings of the bellington escutcheon garnished sable a buck's head coped or he lauded almost extravagantly my nether extremities my swelling calves and silk hose drawn up to the limit and eulogized glowingly my other hidden treasures in priceless lace which he said he could conjure up he urged me stating that he felt it his mission in life to urge me to defile the marriage bed to commit adultery at the earliest possible opportunity the honourable mrs mervyn talboys in amazon costume hard hat jack boots cocksbird vermilion waistcoat fawn musketeer gauntlets and braided drums long train held up and hunting crop with which she strikes her welt constantly also me because he saw me on the polo ground of the phoenix park at the match all ireland versus the rest of ireland my eyes i know shone divinely as i watched captain slogger denny of the Inniskillings win the final chucker on his darling cob centaur this plebeian don juan observed me from behind the hackney car and sent me in double envelopes in obscene photograph such as are sold after dark on paris boulevards insulting to any lady i have it still it represents a partially nude signorita frail and lovely his wife as he solemnly assured me taken by him from nature practising illicit intercourse with a muscular torero evidently a blackguard he urged me to do likewise to misbehave to sin with officers of the garrison he implored me to soil his letter in an unspeakable manner to chastise him as he richly deserves to bestride and ride him to give him a most vicious horsewhipping mrs bellingham me too mrs yelverton berry me too several highly respectable dublin ladies hold up improper letters received from bloom the honourable mrs mervy talboys stamps her jingling spurs in a sudden paroxysm of fury i will by the god above me i scorch the pigeon-livered cur as long as i can stand over him i'll flay him alive bloom his eyes closing quails expectantly here he squirms again he pants cringing i love the danger the honourable mrs mervyn talboys very much so i'll make it hot for you i'll make you dance jack latin for that mrs bellingham tan his breech well the upstart write the stars and stripes on it mrs yelverton berry disgraceful there's no excuse for him a married man bloom all these 
people i only meant the spanking idea a warm tingly glow without effusion refined birching to stimulate the circulation the honourable mrs mervyn talboys laughs derisively oh did you my fine fellow well by the living god you'll get the surprise of your life now believe me the most unmerciful hiding a man ever bargained for you have lashed the dormant tigress in my nature into fury mrs bellingham shakes her muff and quizzing glasses vindictively make him smart hannah dear give him ginger thrash the mongrel within an inch of his life the catanine tails geld him vivisect him bloom shuddering shrinking joins his hands with hangdong mean oh cold oh shivery it was your ambrosial beauty forgive forgive kismet let me off this once he offers the other cheek mrs yelverton berry severely don't do so on any account mrs talboys he should be soundly trounced the honourable mrs mervyn talboys unbuttoning her gauntlet violently i'll do no such thing pig-dog and always was ever since he was pupped to dare address me i'll flog him black and blue in the public streets i'll dig my spurs in him to the rowel he is a well-known cuckold she swishes her hunting crop savagely in the air take down his trousers without loss of time come here sir quick ready bloom trembling beginning to obey the weather has been so warm Davy Stevens, ringleted, passes with a bevy of barefoot newsboys. Davy Stevens. Messenger of the Sacred Heart, an evening telegraph with St. Patrick's Day supplement, containing the new address of all the cuckolds in Dublin. The very Reverend Ken O'Hanlon, in cloth of gold cope, elevates and exposes a marble timepiece. Before him, Father Conroy and the Reverend John Hughes J. bend low. The timepiece. Unportaling. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. The brass quoits of a bed are heard to jingle. Jig, 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 jig. A panel of fog rolls back rapidly, revealing rapidly in the jury box the faces of Martin Cunningham, Foreman, Silk Hatted, Jack Power, Simon Dedalus, Tom Kernan, Ned Lambert, John Henry Menton, Miles Crawford, Lenahan, Paddy Leonard, Nosy Flynn, McCoy, and the featureless face of a nameless one. The nameless one bareback riding wait for age gob he organized her the jurors all their heads turned to his voice really the nameless one snarls arse over tip hundred shillings to five the jurors all their heads lowered in assent most of us thought as much first watch he is a marked man another girl's plate cut wanted jack the ripper a thousand pounds reward second watch awed whispers and in black a mormon anarchist the crier loudly whereas leopold bloom of no fixed abode he is a well-known dynamitard forger bigamist bawd and cuckold and a public nuisance to the citizens of dublin and whereas at this commission of assizes the most honourable his honour sir frederick falconer recorder of dublin in judicial garb of grey stone rises from the bench stone bearded he bears in his arms an umbrella sceptre from his forehead arise starkly the mosaic ram's horns the recorder i will put an end to this white slave traffic and rid dublin of this odious pest scandalous he dons the black cap let him be taken mr subsheriff from the dock where he now stands and detained in custody in mountjoy prison during his majesty's pleasure and there be hanged by the neck until he is dead and therein fail not at your peril or may the lord have mercy on your soul remove him a black skull-cap descends upon his head the sub-sheriff long john fanning appears smoking a pungent henry clay long john fanning scowls and calls with rich rolling utterance 
Who'll hang Judas Iscariot? H. rumbled Master Barber in a blood-coloured jerkin and tanner's apron, a rope coiled over his shoulder, mounts the block. A life-preserver and a nail-studded bludgeon are stuck in his belt. He rubs grimly his grappling hands, knobbed with knuckle-dusters. Rumbled to the recorder with sinister familiarity. Hanging Harry, your majesty, the mercy terror. Five guineas a jugular, neck or nothing. The bells of George's church toll slowly, loud, dark iron. The bells. Hi ho, hi ho. Bloom desperately. Wait, stop, gulls, good heart, I saw, innocence, girl in the monkey house, zoo, lewd chimpanzee, breathlessly, pelvic basin, her artless blush unmanned me, overcome with emotion, I left the precincts, he turns to a figure in the crowd appealing, Hines, may I speak to you, you know me, that three shillings you can keep, if you want a little more, Hines, coldly, you are a perfect stranger, second watch points to the corner, the bomb is here, first watch, infernal machine with a time fuse, bloom, no, no, pig's feet, I was at a funeral, first watch, draws his truncheon, liar, the beagle lifts his snout, showing the grey, scorbutic face of Paddy Dignam. He has gnawed all. He exhales a putrid, carcass-fed breath. He grows to human size and shape. His dachshund coat becomes a brown mortuary habit. His green eyes flash bloodshot. Half of one ear, all the nose, and both thumbs are ghoul-eaten. Paddy Dignam, in a hollow voice, it is true it was my funeral. Dr. Finucane pronounced life extinct when I succumbed to the disease from natural causes. He lifts his mutilated ashen face moonwards and bays lugubriously. Bloom in triumph. You hear? Paddy Dignam. Bloom, I am Paddy Dignam's spirit. List, list, oh, list. Bloom. The voice is the voice of Esau. Second watch blesses himself. How is that possible? First watch. It is not in the penny catechism. Paddy Dignam. By metempsychosis spooks. A voice. Oh, rocks. Paddy Dignam, earnestly. Once I was in the employ of Mr. J. H. Menton, solicitor commissioner for oaths and affidavits of twenty-seven bachelors walk now i am defunct the wall of the heart hypertrophied hard lines the poor wife was awfully cut up how is she bearing it keep her off that bottle of sherry he looks round him a lamp i must satisfy an animal need that buttermilk didn't agree with me. The portly figure of John O'Connell, caretaker, stands forth holding a bunch of keys tied with crepe. Beside him stands Father Coffee, chaplain, toad-bellied, wry-necked, in a surplice and bandana nightcap, holding sleepily a staff of twisted poppies. Father Coffoy yawns, then chants with a hoarse croak, Nemine, Jacobs, full biscuits, Amen. John O'Connell, foghorn stormily through his megaphone. Dignam Patrick T. Deceased. Paddy Dignam, with pricked-up ears, winces. Overtones. He wriggles forward and places an ear to the ground. My master's voice. John O'Connell. Burial docket letter number U.P. 85,000. Field 17. House of Keys. Plot one hundred and one. Paddy Dignam listens with visible effort, thinking, his tail stiff-pointed, his ears cocked. Paddy Dignam. Pray for the repose of his soul. He worms down through a coal hole, his brown habit trailing its tether over rattling pebbles. 
After him toddles an obese grandfather rat on fungus turtle paws under a grey carapace. Dignam's voice, muffled, is heard baying underground. Dignam's dead and gone below. Tom Roquefort, robin red-breasted, in cap and breeches, jumps from his two-columned machine. Tom Roquefort, a hand to his breastbone, bows. Reuben J. A. Florin, I find him. He fixes the manhole with a resolute stare. My turn now. Follow me up to Carlo. He executes a daredevil salmon leap in the air and is engulfed in the coal hole. Two discs on the columns wobble, eyes of naught. All recedes. Bloom plodges forward again through the sump. Kisses chirp amid the rifts of fog. A piano sounds. He stands before a lighted house, listening. The kisses, winging from their bowers, fly about him, twittering, warbling, cooing. The kisses, warbling. Leo, twittering. Icky, licky, micky, sticky for Leo. Cooing. Coo, 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 yum, yum, wum, wum. Warbling. Big, come big, pirouette. Leopold, pold. Twittering. Leo, Lee. Warbling. Oh, Leo. They rustle flutter upon his garments, a light, bright, giddy flecks, silvery sequins. Bloom. A man's touch, sad music, church music, perhaps here. Zoe Higgins, a young whore in a sapphire slip, closed with three bronze buckles, a slim black velvet fillet around her throat, nods, trips down the steps, and accosts him. Zoe. Are you looking for someone? He's inside, with his friend. Bloom. Is this Mrs. Max? Zoe. No, 81, Mrs. Cowens. You might go farther and fare worse. Mother Slipper Slapper. Familiarly. She's on the job herself tonight with the vet, her tipster, and gives her all the winners and pays for her son in Oxford, working overtime, but her luck's turned today. Suspiciously. You're not his father, are you? Bloom. Not I. Zoe. You both in black. Has little mousy any tickles tonight? His skin, alert, feels her fingertips approach. A hand glides over his left thigh. Zoe. How's the nuts? Bloom. Offside, curiously, they are on the right. Heavier, I suppose. One in a million my tailor, Messius, says. Zoe, in sudden alarm. You've a hard chanker. Bloom. Not likely. Zoe. I feel it. Her hand slides into his left trouser pocket and brings out a hard black shriveled potato. She regards it and Bloom with dumb, moist lips. Bloom. A talisman heirloom zoe for zoe for keeps for being so nice eh she puts the potato greedily into a pocket then links his arm cuddling him with supple warmth he smiles uneasily slowly note by note oriental music is played he gazes in the tawny crystal of her eyes ringed with kohol his smile softens zoe you'll know me the next time bloom forlornly I never loved a dear gazelle, but it was sure to... Gazelles are leaping, feeding on the mountains. Near are lakes. Round their shores file shadows black of cedar groves. Aroma rises, a strong hair growth of resin. It burns the orient, a sky of sapphire, cleft by the bronze flight of eagles. Under it lies the woman city, nude, white, still, cool, in luxury. A fountain murmurs among damask roses. Mammoth roses murmur of scarlet wine grapes. A wine of shame lust blood exudes, strangely murmuring. Zoe, murmuring sing song with the music, her odalisk lips lusciously smeared with salve of swine fat and rose water. Skorakan Iwenawak, Benoith, Hir Shalom. Bloom fascinated. I thought you were of good stock by your accent, Zoe. And you know what thought did? 
She bites his ear gently with little gold-stopped teeth, sending on him a cloying breath of stale garlic. The roses draw apart, disclose a sepulchre of the gold of kings and their mouldering bones. Bloom draws back, mechanically caressing her right bub with a flat, awkward hand. Are you a Dublin girl? Zoe catches a stray hair deftly and twists it into her coil. No bloody fear, I'm English. Have you a swagger root? Bloom, as before. Rarely smoke, dear. Cigars now and then. Childish device. Lewdly. The mouth can be better engaged than with the cylinder of rank weed. Zoe. Go on, make a stump speech out of it. Bloom. In workmen's corduroy overhauls, black gansey with red flowing tie and Apache cap. Mankind is incorrigible. Sir Walter Raleigh brought from the new world that potato and that weed, the one a killer of pestilence by absorption, the other a poisoner of the ear, eye, heart, memory, will, understanding, all. That is to say, he brought the poison a hundred years before another person, whose name I forget, brought the food, suicide, lies, all our habits. Why, look at our public life. Midnight chimes from distant steeples, the chimes. Turn again, Leopold, Lord Mayor of Dublin. Bloom, in alderman's gown and chain. Electors of Arran Quay, Inns Quay, Rotunda, Mountjoy, and North Dock, better run a tram line, I say, from the cattle mark to the river. That's the music of the future. That's my program. Qui bono? But our buccaneering Vanderdeckens in their phantom ship of finance... An elector. Three times three for our future chief magistrate. The aurora borealis of the torchlight procession leaps. The torchbearers. Hooray! Several well-known burgesses, city magnates and freemen of the city, shake hands with Bloom and congratulate him. Timothy Harrington, late thrice Lord Mayor of Dublin, imposing in mayoral scarlet, gold chain and white silk tie, confers with Councillor Lork and Sherlock Locum Tenens. They nod vigorously in agreement. Late Lord Mayor Harrington, in scarlet robe with mace, gold mayoral chain, and large white silk scarf. That alderman, Sir Leo Bloom's speech, be printed at the expense of the ratepayers, that the house in which he was born be ornamented with commemorative tablet, and that the thoroughfare hitherto known as Cow Parlour off Cork Street be henceforth designated Boulevard Bloom. Councillor Lork and Sherlock. Carried unanimously. Bloom impassionedly. These flying Dutchmen, or lying Dutchmen, as they recline in their upholstered poop, casting dice, what wreck they? Machines, is their cry, their chimera, their panacea. Labor-saving apparatuses, supplanters, bugbears, manufactured monsters for multiple murder, hideous hobgoblins produced by a horde of capitalistic lusts upon our prostituted labor. The poor man starves while they are grassing their royal mountain stags or shooting peasants or fartridges in their purblind pomp of pelf and power. But their reign is rover forever and ever and ever. Prolonged applause. Venetian masts, maypoles, and festal arches spring up. A streamer bearing the legend Cead Millefeilte and Mat Bob Melik Israel spans the street. All the windows are thronged with sightseers, chiefly ladies. Along the route, the regiments of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the King's Own Scottish Borderers, the Cameron Highlanders, and the Welsh Fusiliers, standing to attention the crowd. Boys from high school are perched on the lampposts, telegraph poles, window sills, cornices, gutters, chimney pots, railings, rain spouts, whistling and cheering. The pillar of the cloud appears. A fife and drum band is heard in the distance playing the coal nider. The beaters approach with imperial eagles hoisted, trailing banners and waving oriental palms. The crystal elephantine papal standards rises high, surrounded by pennons of the civic flag. The van of the procession appears headed by John Howard Parnell, city marshal, in a chessboard tabard, the Athlone Porcivant and Ulster King of Arms. They are followed by the Right Honourable Joseph Hutchinson, Lord Mayor of Dublin, his lordship the Lord Mayor of Cork, their worships the mayors of Limerick, Galway, Sligo, and Waterford, twenty-eight Irish representative peers, sirdars, grandees, and maharajas bearing the cloth of estate. The Dublin Metropolitan Fire Brigade, 
the chapter of the saints of finance in their plutocratic order of precedence, the bishop of Down and Connor, his eminence Michael Cardinal Logue, archbishop of Armagh, primate of all Ireland, his grace, the most reverend Dr. William Alexander, archbishop of Armagh, primate of all Ireland, the chief rabbi, the Presbyterian moderator, the heads of all the Baptist, Anabaptist, Methodist, and Moravian chapels, and the honorary secretary of the Society of Friends. After them march the guilds and trades and train bands with flying colors, coopers, bird fanciers, millwrights, newspaper canvassers, law scriveners, masseurs, vinters, trussmakers, chimney sweeps, lard refiners, tabinet and poplin weavers, farriers, Italian warehousemen, church decorators, bootjack manufacturers, undertakers, silk mercers, lapidaries, salesmasters, cork cutters, assessors of fire losses, dyers and cleaners, export bottlers, fellmongers, ticket writers, heraldic seal engravers, horse repository hands, bullion brokers, cricket and archery outfitters, riddle makers, egg and potato factors, hosiers and glovers, plumbing contractors. After the march gentlemen of the bedchamber, black rod, deputy garter, gold stick, the master of horse, the lord great chamberlain, the earl marshal, the high constable carrying the sword of state, st stephen's iron crown and chalice and bible four buglers on foot blow a senate beefeaters reply winding clarions of welcome under an arch of triumph bloom appears bareheaded in a crimson velvet mantle trimmed with ermine bearing st edward's staff the orb and sceptre with the dove the curtana he is seated on a milk-white horse with long flowing crimson tail richly caparisoned with golden headstall wild excitement the ladies from their balconies throw down rose petals the air is perfumed with essences the men cheer bloom's boys run amid the bystanders with branches of hawthorn and wren bushes bloom's boys the wren the wren the king of all birds saint stephen's his day was caught in the firs a blacksmith murmurs or oh, the honour of god and is that bloom he scarcely looks thirty-one a pavier and flagger that's the famous bloom now the world's greatest reformer hats off all uncover their heads women whisper eagerly a millionaires richly isn't he simply wonderful a noblewoman nobly all that man has seen a feminist, masculinely, and done. A bell-hanger. A classic face, he has the forehead of a thinker. Bloom's weather. A sunburst appears in the northwest. The bishop of Down and Connor. I here present your undoubted emperor, president, and king chairman, the most serene and potent, and very puissant ruler of this realm. God save Leopold I. All god save leopold the first bloom and dalmatic and purple mantle to the bishop of down and connor with dignity thanks somewhat eminent sir william archbishop of armagh in purple stock and shovel hat will you to your power cause law and mercy to be executed in all your judgments in ireland and territories thereunto belonging bloom placing his right hand on his testicles swears so may the creator deal with me all this i promise to do michael archbishop of armagh pours a cruise of hair oil over bloom's head gaudium magnum annuntio vobis habemus carnificum leopold patrick andrew david george be thou anointed Bloom assumes a mantle of cloth of gold and puts on a ruby ring. He ascends and stands on the stone of destiny. The representative peers put on at the same time their twenty-eight crowns. Joy bells ring in Christ Church, St. Patrick's, George's, and Gay Malahide. Myris bizarre fireworks go up from all sides with symbolical phallopyrotechnic designs. The peers do homage one by one, approaching and genuflecting. The peers i do become your liege man of life and limb to earthly worship bloom holds up his right hand on which sparkles the koh-i-noor diamond his palfrey neighs immediate silence 
Wireless intercontinental and interplanetary transmitters are set for reception of message. Bloom. My subjects. We hereby nominate our faithful charger, Copula Felix, hereditary grand vizier, and announce that we have this day repudiated our former spouse and have bestowed our royal hand upon the princess Selina, the splendor of night. The former morganatic spouse of Bloom is hastily removed in the Black Mariah. The Princess Selina, in moon-blue robes, a silver crescent on her head, descends from a sedan chair borne by two giants. An outburst of cheering. John Howard Parnell raises the royal standard. Illustrious Bloom, successor to my famous brother. Bloom embraces John Howard Parnell. We thank you from our heart, John, for this right royal welcome to greet Erin, the promised land of our common ancestors. The freedom of the city is presented to him embodied in a charter. The keys of Dublin crossed on a crimson cushion are given to him. He shows all that he is wearing green socks. Tom Kernan. You deserve it, your honor. Bloom. On this day twenty years ago we overcame the hereditary enemy of Ladysmith. Our howitzers and camel-swivel guns played on his lines with telling effect. Half a league onward, they charge! All is lost now. Do we yield? No! We drive them headlong. Lo, we charge, deploying to the left our light horse swept across the heights of Plevna, and, uttering their war cry, Bonafide Sabaoth, sabred the Saracen gunners to a man. The Chapel of Freeman Typesetters. Here! Here! John Wise Nolan. There's the man that got away, James Stevens. A blue coat schoolboy. Bravo! An old resident. You're a credit to your country, sir. That's what you are. An apple woman. He's a man like Ireland once. Bloom. My beloved subjects, a new era is about to dawn. I, Bloom. Tell you verily, it is even now at hand. Yea, on the word of a bloom, ye shall ere long enter into the golden city, which is to be the new bloom Muslim in the Nova Hibernia of the future. Thirty-two workmen wearing rosettes from all the counties of Ireland, under the guidance of Derwin the Builder, construct the new bloom Muslim. It is a colossal edifice with crystal roof, built in the shape of a huge pork kidney, containing forty thousand rooms. In the course of its extension, several buildings and monuments are demolished. Government offices are temporarily transferred to railway sheds. Numerous houses are razed to the ground. The inhabitants are lodged in barrels and boxes, all marked in red with the letters L.B. Several paupers fall from a ladder. A part of the walls of Dublin, crowded with loyal sightseers, collapses. The sightseers, dying. Morituri te salutant. They die. A man in a brown mackintosh springs up through a trapdoor. He points an elongated finger at Bloom, the man in the mackintosh. Don't you believe a word he says? That man is Leopold Mantosh, the notorious fire-raiser. His real name is Higgins. Bloom. Shoot him, dog of a Christian. So much for Mantosh. A cannon shot. The man in the Macintosh disappears. Bloom, with his scepter, strikes down poppies. The instantaneous deaths of many powerful enemies, graziers, members of parliament, members of standing committees, are reported. Bloom's bodyguard distribute Mondi money, commemoration medals, Loaves and fishes, temperance badges, expensive Henry Clay cigars, free cowbones for soup, rubber preservatives in sealed envelopes tied with gold thread, butterscotch, pineapple rock, billets due in the form of cocked hats, ready-made suits, porringers of toad in the hole, bottles of J's fluid, purchase stamps, forty days indulgences, spurious coins, dairy-fed pork sausages, theatre passes, Season tickets available for all tram lines, coupons of the royal and privileged Hungarian lottery, penny dinner counters, cheap reprints of the world's twelve worst books, Froggy and Fritz, politic, care of the baby, infantilic, 
Fifty meals for seven slash six. Cullinick. Was Jesus a sun myth? Historic. Expel that pain. Medic. Infant's compendium of the universe. Cosmic. Let's all chortle. Hilaric. Canvassers vade mecum. Journalic. Love letters of mother assistant. Erotic. Who's who in space? Asterisk. Songs that reached our heart. Melodic. Pennywise's way to wealth. Parsimonic. A general rush and scramble. Women press forward to touch the hem of Bloom's robe. The lady Gwendolyn Dubedat bursts through the throng, leaps on his horse and kisses him on both cheeks amid great acclamation. A magnesium flashlight photograph is taken. Babes and sucklings are held up. The women. Little father, little father. The babes and sucklings. Clap hands till Poldy comes home, cakes in his pocket for Leo alone. Bloom bending down pokes baby Boardman gently in the stomach. Baby Boardman hiccups, curdled milk flowing from his mouth. Ha ya ya ya. Bloom shaking hands with the blind stripling. My more than brother, placing his arms round the shoulder of an old couple. Dear old friends. He plays pussy four corners with ragged boys and girls. Peep, bo peep. He wheels twins in a perambulator. Tic tac too, would you set a shoe? He performs juggler's tricks, draws red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet silk handkerchiefs from his mouth. Rigg, thirty two feet per second. He consoles a widow. Absence makes the heart grow younger. He dances the highland fling with grotesque antics. Leg it, you devils. He kisses the policeman. You pee up, you pee up. He whispers in the ear of a blushing waitress and laughs kindly. <laughs> naughty, naughty. He eats a raw turnip offered him by Maurice Butterly, farmer. Fine, splendid. He refuses to accept three shillings offered him by Joseph Hines, journalist. <laughs> My dear fellow, not at all. He gives his coat to a beggar. Please accept. He takes part in a stomach race with elderly male and female cripples. Come on, boys, wriggle it, girls. The citizen, choked with emotion, brushes aside a tear in his emerald muffler. May the good God bless him. The ram's horns sound for silence. The standard of Zion is hosted. Bloom uncloaks impressively, revealing obesity, unrolls a paper, and reads solemnly. Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, Haggadah, Tefillin, Kosher, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, Rosh Hashanah, Beni, Brith, Bar, Mitzvah, Mazov, Azkenazm, Meshugah, Taleth. An official translation is read by Jimmy Henry, Assistant Town Clerk, Jimmy Henry. The court of conscience is now open. His most Catholic majesty will now administer open-air justice. Free medical and legal advice, solution of doubles and other problems, all cordially invited, given at this our loyal city of Dublin, in the year one of the paradisiacal era. Paddy Leonard. What am I to do about my rates and taxes? Bloom. Pay them, my friend. Paddy Leonard. Thank you. Nosy Flynn. Can I raise the mortgage on my fire insurance? Bloom. Obdurately. Sirs, take notice that by the law of torts you are bound over in your own recognizances for six months in the sum of five pounds. J. J. O'Molly. A Daniel, did I say? Nay, a Peter O'Brien! Nosy Flynn. Where do I draw the five pounds? Pisser Burke. For bladder trouble? Bloom. Acid, knit, hydrochlor, dill, twenty minims, tinct, nux, vom, five minims, Extra taraxel lick, thirty minims, ac dister in die. Chris Callanan. What is the parallax of the subsolar ecliptic of Aldebaran? Bloom. Pleased to hear from you, Chris K. Eleven. Joe Hines. Why aren't you in uniform? Bloom. When my progenitor of sainted memory wore the uniform of Austrian despot in a dank prison, where was yours? Ben Dollard. Pansies. Bloom. Embellish. Beautify. Suburban gardens. Ben Dollard. When twins arrive. 
BLOOM. FATHER? POTTER. DAD. STARTS THINKING. LARRY O'ROURKE. An eight-day license for my new premises. You remember me, Sir Leo, when you were in number seven. I'm sending around a dozen of stout for the missus. Bloom, coldly. You have the advantage of me. Lady Bloom accepts no presents. Crofton. This is indeed a festivity. Bloom, solemnly. You call it a festivity. I call it a sacrament. Alexander Keyes. When will we have our own house of keys? Bloom. I stand for the reform of municipal morals and the plain Ten Commandments. New worlds for old. Union of all, Jew, Moslem, and Gentile. Three acres and a cow for all children of nature. Saloon motor hearses, compulsory manual labor for all. All parks open to the public day and night. Electric dish scrubbers. Tuberculosis, lunacy, war, and mendicancy must now cease. General amnesty, weekly carnival with masked license bonuses for all, Esperanto, the universal language with universal brotherhood, no more patriotism of bar spongers and dropsical impostors, free money, free rent, free love, and a free lay church in a free lay state. O Madden Burke, free fox in a free hen roost. Davy Byrne, yawning. Bloom. Mixed races and mixed marriage. Lenahan. What about mixed bathing? End of Ulysses 15b. Recorded by Anita Roy Dobbs, San Francisco, June 2006.